Good evening. Welcome to episode six of the Hope for Healing video podcast. I'm Dr. John Strax, joining you from my office in Chicago. And I'm here this evening with my friend and colleague, Dr. David Schechter, who's joining us from his home in Los Angeles. Hope for Healing is a joint effort between me and the Curable app, which most of you are familiar with. For those who don't know one or the other of us, I'm a physician who runs a mind-body medicine practice in the Chicago area focused on the reduction and the elimination of physical symptoms using mind-body medicine methods. Curable is an amazing app focused on the same goal. And we've been working together since their inception about five years ago. We started this Hope for Healing series at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic as we thought about what we could do to help support people during this difficult time. So before I introduce Dr. Schechter and we get started, I just wanna go over a couple of items. Uh, first of all, Dr. Schechter and I will be discussing mind-body medicine for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take some questions after that. So our friends at Curable are monitoring both the Facebook live chat and the Zoom chat. So they'll collect all the questions and send them to us during the question and answer session. If you have questions that you wanna to ask to either or both of us, just type them into the chat box on Zoom or to the chat on the Facebook feed and we'll do our best at the end to answer as many questions as we can. Secondly, I uh, want everybody to know that I have been able to expand my telehealth practice significantly during the COVID-19 epidemic. And so I'm also working to sustain that indefinitely over time. So no matter where you are, if you're feeling stuck with symptoms, feel free to reach out to my office at drstrax.com and my staff can give you all the details about speaking with me directly about your situation. And lastly, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about terminology. So many of you know that we're here discussing mind-body medicine, which means that, for me at least, that our body can express for us what's going on in our mind or in our lives. And that, I think, is universal. It's not a bad thing. It only becomes, quote, bad if you enter a medical system that doesn't understand that and assumes that all physical symptoms are physical in origin. I think humans have always expressed our lives through our bodies and we always will. And so our goal here is to help you understand that better and to learn what to do about it so that it's no longer physically uncomfortable or physically painful for you. Both Dr. Schechter and I learned about this concept initially from a physician named Dr. John Sarno, who many of you have probably heard of. Dr. Sarno was a physiatrist in New York City, started in the 1960s, really understood this mind-body concept well, and uh, he wrote several books about it in the 1980s and 1990s. He called the concept tension myositis syndrome, tension myositis syndrome, or TMS, which is a term that both Dr. Schechter and I have used for years. These days, 21st century, I think we have a, a better understanding of the entire concept. And so while Dr. Schechter and I both honor uh, Dr. Sarno's mentorship of us in this field, we prefer to use the more updated and more precise term of mind-body medicine. Occasionally, you'll hear us slip back and use the old term of TMS. Regardless of what we use, regardless of what we're calling it, it refers to this particular concept. What happens in our lives shows up in our bodies. And that doesn't make us bad or, or even sick. It just makes us human. So with that, let me introduce Dr. David Schechter. Dr. Schechter is a physician in Culver City, California. He received his medical degree initially from the New York University School of Medicine, has been practicing family medicine, sports medicine, and mind-body medicine for over 25 years now. He's on the medical staff at Senior Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles as both a family medicine and a sports medicine physician. And I believe he either is or has been on the faculty of the University of Southern California School of Medicine as well. 
He's been a pioneer in the field of mind-body medicine since early in his career, has written two books on the subject that we'll talk about as we go along. He's had his own medical practice in the Los Angeles area for several decades and frequently writes lectures and does research in this area of medicine. He also holds a special place in my heart. As many of you know, if you've listened to my podcast with Like Mind, Like Body, I first found out about mind body medicine over 20 years ago when I had to solve my own health issues of chronic pain and neurological symptoms. And once I figured out what was going on, I was able to get a copy of Dr. Schechter's original book, The Mind Body Workbook. And I used that over the course of several months to consolidate the healing that I was doing. And when nobody in my hometown of Chicago really knew what was going on with me or what I should do, Dr. Schechter's work helped point me towards the cure that really got my life back at the time and ultimately pushed me to enter this field of medicine. So for that, uh, I will always be grateful. Uh, since then, he's become a good friend and a mentor to me. And I'm thrilled that you're here this evening to talk about one of our favorite subjects, mind-body medicine. So Dave, welcome to Hope for Healing. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So I've got a few questions that I want to go over with you as we talk about this subject. The first is like so many people who work in this field, I think you first found out about mind-body medicine through your own experience with pain. Um, can you tell us about that and your first interactions with Dr. Sarno? I think when you were a student, correct? I was a medical student at NYU, and the immediate precipitant was knee pain that wasn't able to be clearly diagnosed and treated by the conventional medical system, which included the student health physician and the orthopedic doctors that he recommended me to. And I walked into Dr. Sarno's office not knowing that he was a mind-body medicine thinker because he wasn't as well known yet. He had not yet written his first book. And when I presented my case to him and requested perhaps some physical therapy or something of that sort that was his expertise that he had lectured to us about as a physical medicine rehab doctor, he instead threw it back at me and said, I don't know if you'll be open to this, but 95% of this chronic pain is psychophysiologic, psychosomatic. These are terms for mind-body basically. And it was like getting hit with a blast of cold air in, the, in his office that day, because it was not what I was expecting to hear. But I was open enough that when he invited me to attend his upcoming seminar lecture, uh, I decided to go. And what he presented that evening was very convincing to me and very much seemed like it fit me to a T. And many of my patients over the decades since have commented that they'll read something about this condition and they'll feel like it fits them to a T. Meaning for my, in my case, I was a conscientious medical student. I wasn't enjoying the first year of medical school very much. There's a lot of memorization involved and not, not too much uh, clinical contact with patients. I was, um, my social life wasn't very good. And so I had a number of stressors going on. I was, I tended to be a worrier by nature and it made total sense to me. So much so that when I went back to my apartment that evening after his uh, one or two hour seminar lecture and sat down on my bed in this little tiny room, looking out the windows at this brick wall that was about three feet away from my windows in, in Manhattan, I felt like a weight was lifting off of my shoulders. And that was the beginning of my healing process that evening, which continued through attending additional seminars, being examined by him, and resuming the sports that meant so much to me, like running and basketball that were my major stress relievers, but which I had to paradoxically give up because of the pain I was experiencing. So that was my huge first uh, experience with Dr. Sarno. And then, so a number of people will have experiences like that. They'll learn, you know, as, as healthcare practitioners, students, they'll learn about this, but they won't necessarily make a career out of it or bring it into their practice. And so how did you decide that you were going to practice in this area of medicine as you went through the rest of your residency training and opening up your own practice? When I shared my experience with other medical students and physicians at NYU, I found a lot of skepticism and resistance. Yet I knew I had had a powerful experience in healing my, myself with, his, with Dr. Sarno's help. 
And so I contacted Dr. Sarno and, and talked about the possibility of doing some summer research with him and you know, spending time in his office. And fortunately, I was able to get a grant, not for that summer, but for the following summer. And that really consolidated my interest and in, in, in expertise in the field because I was able to sit on, on do dozens of consultations he did, attend a seminar, this time as his junior colleague rather than just as a patient. And I phoned 177 of his former patients as part of a follow-up study that he proposed doing. And I kept hearing the same kind of amazing stories that I had experienced from so many of these people whose names were just selected from the chart rack that existed on his wall at that time before electronic records and all of that. And so that was, again, a, a powerful reinforcer for me. But as I continued through medical school, again, I found that although I was able to delve deeper into patient psychological issues and that I often got as a result of that, great benefit to their health and well-being that maybe other practitioners or other residents and students were not getting, I didn't know how I would take that forward. Uh, I thought about going into Dr. Sarno's field of physical medicine rehab, um, and then ultimately selected family medicine, which I thought was a holistically based field, and did, did training in that field. And, and all medical training is very absorbing. It doesn't give you a tremendous amount of time for reflecting and thinking, unfortunately, along the way. But little bits and pieces along the way, I continued with the mind-body approach. And then my career took various winding turns, including, as Dr. Strax mentioned, uh, some teaching in a residency program, practicing, uh, working for other doctors, urgent care, things like that. And um, eventually, uh, I opened a small part-time private practice. It was about 25 years ago. And um, Dr. Sarno at that time and I reconnected. We had been in touch over the years, but uh, had not had been fairly distant, both uh, geographically and otherwise. We reconnected on a little project that someone else had proposed, and I spent some time in New York with him. And he finished the conversation saying, are you doing this mind-body work in California? And I said, I'm doing it. I'd like to have more patients, obviously, with an interest in it, because as we'll discuss this evening or this afternoon, um, people being interested in it is often a key, key factor in, in helping patients to use these techniques. And he said, well, I, I, I get these phone calls now. I, I need doctors in other parts of the country to refer to, and I don't have anybody in California. Can I give them your name? Well, as you can imagine, I thought maybe I'd get one or two calls a year. But his books had started to come out. He had written his first book and then his second book, which became a bestseller. And I started getting one or two calls a day initially, not just from Los Angeles, but from San Francisco and from Phoenix, Arizona, and from all over. And that enabled me to begin to build up a practice with people who had that interest, had that spark of information, knowledge, and interest, which, of course, allowed me to be more, even more excited and passionate about helping them to get better. So that's how it, that's how it got going. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I know, I remember when I first got to Chicago, it was the same kind of thing, you know, one or two people a week or a month would call. And now it's obviously three and four and five and six and seven people a day as so many more people have become aware that this can be helpful. So I was trying to do the math earlier. I got your workbook in 1999. That was actually before I went to medical school. I didn't start school until 2001. But it couldn't have come out, you couldn't have written it that much more before then. How did you happen to, to write and publish that uh, when you were first starting out? I had been using as one of the techniques, of course, I tried to kind of copy Dr. Sarno's model initially. So there was a consultation with a diagnosis, uh, which is basically an office visit. And then there was uh, an evening seminar we do initially once a month and try to teach people. And then I realized that there were bits and pieces I, could, I needed to offer. So home education, well, I could have them read Dr. Sarno's book, of course. So there was a couple of them at that point. I really found that journaling, which Dr. Sarno had just kind of touched on, but had never really delved into. I found that journaling, that writing about your emotions, that writing about your feelings regularly was a very effective technique for my patients to use. And I, I studied the subject of journaling used it with my patients and ultimately decided that I could contribute to the field by organizing a workbook because it's hard to journal sometimes in a blank notebook. Um, Curable has some journaling 
that they offer, of course, in the app. But let's talk about the, you know, the non-digital world that existed then, um, or the pre-iPhone Android world. And so people would write in a notebook their feelings, but that can be difficult to do day after day without guidance. So the Mind Body Workbook basically is a guided journal. It gives you four questions or so a day for 30 days, and it takes you through the process of self-exploration that people need to do often in order to get better from a mind-body condition. So that's how it developed. And in fact, I wrote it in that year, apparently, that you got it. 1999 was when it came out, uh, the same year that my oldest son was born. So it's easy for me to remember. And um, I continue to use it with my patients. There, there's other things out now that involve journaling, but obviously I'm comfortable with, with the style of it and all of that. And uh, it's, it's been helpful for many thousands of patients uh, since then. It's great. I, you know, I'm trying to even think back then, 1999, it's pre-internet. And so it's not like I looked you up on, on Google to find you. And so I don't even remember exactly. Well, there, was, there, was, there was internet actually, because was my, my website, mindbodymedicine.com, oh, no, no, right, right. right. okay, yeah, yeah. went up in 97. My practice yeah. was 94, 95. My website went up in 97. And then after doing the seminar for a couple of years, uh, a patient said to me, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't make your seminar next week. Is there any chance you would record it? And it was like a light bulb went off. Oh, yeah, I'll record it for you. And I recorded it on cassette because that was what was existing in 1997 or six or whatever it was. And then I reproduced the cassettes because I thought maybe there would be interest on the part of other patients. And then when I put up the website, I indicated I had a cassette, which was a, sem a live seminar cassette. And that was actually my first product, if you will, in this area. And people started ordering it because, again, there wasn't anything available other than Dr. Sarno's books in 1997. So when you added a different doctor's perspective, someone who had learned from Dr. Sarno, but it built upon those ideas, first with one cassette, then a second one, then a third one where I interviewed a psychologist, uh, Don Dubin, who's, uh, who had worked with me for a number of years at that point. And so suddenly I had three cassettes and then the Mind Body Workbook, and then the cassettes were turned into CDs by a patient of mine who was a sound expert, a sound engineering expert and then eventually uh, MP3. So, you know, I've kind of had to develop things because I was very early in the field, develop things that would help patients, you know, because my concept is, you know, get, if you can, if possible, we'll talk more about this, I'm sure, but get, get a diagnosis if you can from someone like Dr. Strax, myself, other physicians in the country. It's not always possible to do that geographically, but if you can, it's very helpful. From the diagnosis, I usually branch off to the idea of a home educational program, which is also home psychological. So you're learning more about the, the uh, diagnosis, about the condition, about the mind-body mechanisms, and then you're expressing yourself emotionally with the journaling. For some people, that's all you need. For others, we need to go deeper with psychotherapy and other things, but I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself here. What, what do you do? So the initial consultation, so as you said, it's, you know, it's hard for people to find a consultation. There's you, there's me, our colleague, Dr. Schubiner in Detroit, Dr. Rushbaum in New York, but, but there just aren't that many opportunities. As I said earlier, we're trying to make that easier as we continue to expand telehealth options. Mm -hmm. but, but when you do see somebody in your office the first time they come to see you to talk about this, what kinds of things are you looking for and what kinds of things are you evaluating to help you make the diagnosis? Let me first say that there are two types of patients. So there's the, the patient who already is interested in this and says, I want to see Dr. Schechter because I want to see if he can confirm that I might have a mind-body condition that we referred to before as TMS or PPD or whatever. And there's the other group of people who might be coming in to see me for, in my sports medicine uh, background, for back pain or uh, foot pain that doesn't go away or a tingling or numbness or something. And in some cases, I'm finding that they also have a mind-body condition and I'm exposing them to the concept de novo. So there's the two groups of people. But I'm attempting in that first visit in that consultation to uh, look for the, uh, first of all, I want a good, I want just a basic good medical history where I'm, you know, obviously looking for any structural problems or issues that, uh, that might arise. And then I'm exploring much more deep, deeply than physicians typically do, we call the psychosocial history. So I'm asking about a person's personality, the concept of the type T personality we might, we might discuss at some point. I'm asking about a person's 
childhood experiences, what their family of origin was like. I'm asking about what stresses they've experienced recently, perhaps just prior to the onset of the symptoms in, in question. And I'm also asking about the presence of other psychophysiologic conditions and other points in their life, such as they might be coming with back pain, but they may have had tension headaches or migraine headaches or uh, irritable bowel syndrome or other conditions that fall into this general rubric. So that would be a little bit of what I do. And then I, I examine them uh, physically. I'm trying to do whatever is appropriate to the symptoms they have. It often is a detailed muscular neuro, neuro, neurological exam. I'm looking for certain tender points that when present are helpful, but are not 100% uh, required. We're looking for these tender points that Dr. Sarno first identified and that we continue to look for. And then I'm reviewing imaging. I have uh, pretty good skills in reviewing MRIs for the musculoskeletal system. So I'm reviewing imaging to see if they're skeletal um, or if, there's, if their imaging changes that might be noted fall into that general category of, uh, if, if you will, uh, normal variant or gray hair of the spine or that kind of thing, or whether it's something uh, more significant, trying to make that distinction. And then I'm usually able to sit down with them and say to them what their diagnosis is. Um, and then I begin the educational process. You know, I have sort of a 12-step uh, discussion of stages of healing and then um, there's usually a, a series of recommendations for home education uh, and TMS resources. And so uh, uh, I've created now a two page resource list that I target to the individual patient in terms of what I think they should read or study first, second, third. And uh, it leads them, it empowers them to go home and start learning and start getting better. Because the exciting thing about this kind of work is I'm sure you've experienced and, and I've certainly experienced is that it's not really about the doctor fixing you it's about the doctor empowering you to get better. I like that kind of medicine. And obviously, uh, John does as well, or he wouldn't be in it. And many physicians prefer a different role. A surgeon often is a more uh, aggressive uh, practitioner where the patient's the passive recipient of a treatment. And in my approach, it's an educational and guidance type role. And that's consistent with the Latin meaning of doc doctor, which is to teach, doctore. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it goes back to that. It's um, when I was at the major medical center. So I started my career with seven years at Northwestern Medical Center in Chicago. And it, you know, the, the cases kind of came in every now and then, but not that many people saw me for TMS. And so when I did my podcast with Curable in 2017, talking about how I'd learned about this, I say in that podcast, like, I'm just not sure that people, I'm not sure there's a market for this. I'm not sure people really want to want to learn about it. And so as soon as I left the hospital and set up my own practice, it immediately went from 2% of what I was doing to 20% of what I was doing. And it seemed to me in retrospect that the idea that we would teach people what was going on so that they could then become better and go live their lives and not rely on us to continually treat them, prescribe medications. I guess it's just not clear to me that a major medical center really can support that type of practice. Obviously, it makes it makes great sense in every sense of the world or every sense of the word, but it's just not really in the paradigm of how the medical system oftentimes works, which is unfortunate, but I'm, I'm lucky to be able to set up a system where we can make it an expressed goal to bring people into our system, work with them for a while, and then let them go live their lives. We say explicitly, our goal is to see our patients as little as possible over time. Well, it's a very satisfying area of medicine. It's not by nature the most lucrative area of medicine because you're not doing procedures that are often more heavily reimbursed and you're not seeing people back indefinitely or permanently or that type of thing. Um, but so again, um, that may be why the medical industrial complex, if you will, or the medical center, that type of thing, it, it doesn't appeal to them as much because they're being run by uh, administrators that are looking at the, at the bottom line, if you will. Yeah. Uh, okay. As doctors, our bottom line is, are you gonna get better? Our bottom line is, can we heal a patient? Our, our, we feel good when someone says, thanks doctor, I'm doing fine, I'll call you if I need you. Well, that's a win for us. In terms Absolutely. of the major medical center, it's not so lucrative. In terms of the business of medicine, it's not you know, the most lucrative. Uh, aspect, but it's very satisfying and uh, 
and really remarkable. So I told you my own remarkable story a few minutes ago, and uh, John and I have ex experienced with patients hundreds and thousands of literally, in my case, because I've been doing this a long time, thousands of these types of stories. And it's, uh, it's very gratifying. I mean, uh, it, it, many people say that you know, their lives have been saved by this mind-body approach. People with pain for 5, 10, 15 years or other disabling symptoms of, 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 of their health, which no one else could diagnose and treat. Yeah. I want to go back to just for a sec with the initial evaluation. A question I get commonly is what, what were we looking for on an MRI or an x-ray or a CT scan that would make us think that it could be something other than a mind-body medicine issue? Are there certain things that you're looking for that would make you hesitant to want to steer somebody down this path? Well, I think that's, that's a very good question. I'm going to try my best to answer it. Um, first of all, I'm looking to make sure there isn't a chemical cause for their problem. So there are things like uh, you know, rheumatological conditions, which I would put in the category of biochemical or chemical, autoimmune, that type of thing. And those are fairly rare, but uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, these sort of things do come up occasionally. And we want to be psychological methods Uh, classically. So I'm looking for that. In terms of imaging, imaging today is so good that the chances of any patient having something terrible and it not being caught are very, very low. This is not our grandparents or even our parents' generation. I, my parents weren't doctors, but I'm talking about the parents' generation of doctors where things were often missed because there just wasn't the imaging to do it. So imaging today is actually too sensitive. It tells us too much, it gives us too much information and it gives us very little wisdom. So with regard to imaging, I'm looking first of all to see if somebody, you asked me the, the, the pointed question, which is always one of the tough ones. That's why I'm taking a little time to spin on this one. The tough question is what if a patient has, let's say a protruding disc? Let's say that protruding disc is pushing on a nerve and their symptoms are pain down the leg. Versus someone who has a bulging disc, it's not pushing on the nerve, and it's just basically the kind of thing that statistically is found in a very high percentage of people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. I happen to have done a fair amount of training and experience in looking at these types of images. So I'm, in addition to reading the reports, I actually look at the, the images themselves, either online or through, a, they bring in a CD or DVD. Um, I believe that there are people who have structural causes for pain down their leg. And I will, in some cases, direct them toward a biochemical or structural treatment. That might include medication, physical therapy, injections. But this is relatively a small number of the chronic cases. This is more in the acute phase. This is usually in the first couple of months. And it's also much more for people with leg symptoms or arm symptoms, if we're talking about the, the spine, than it is uh, with regard to back pain or neck pain. So surgeons, good surgeons know that they're not gonna fix your back pain with, a, with an operation on your disc. It's not gonna work. But if you have severe and excruciating pain in your leg for two months that hasn't responded to certain types of treatments and medications, I do refer a small number of these people, of whom I see hundreds every year, I, I refer a small number of these people for interventions. So I will say that first of all, therefore I feel I'm being more objective than saying everything is mind body. And secondly, I also believe that there's a concept of the mixed picture. Now this is something that I brought into kind of the discussion, uh, had not been discussed during Dr. Sarno's era, I brought it up in my book that was written about four or five years ago, Think Away Your Pain, because I see it as a spectrum. I, see, I think you can have, you, you can be too black and white on this type of stuff. And the spectrum includes a gray area where a person can have a disc or a structural element, but also a mind-body element. And clearly, unless there is any danger to the patient, it's much safer and extremely effective to pursue the mind-body element because it doesn't involve anything in interventional, it doesn't involve medications, it doesn't involve anything dangerous or even that expensive per se. 
And very often, I'm pleasantly surprised to find that they get completely better or so much better that they don't care about whatever else was a small percentage of it. But I do believe there can be a mixed picture. So I sometimes make a pure mind-body diagnosis. I sometimes, in a small number of cases, in, in, in chronic pain, but in a, perhaps a larger number of cases in acute or sports medicine cases, a structural diagnosis. And then I sometimes make this mixed picture diagnosis. I agree. Any thoughts, any thoughts on that, John? I, I yeah, I agree with the mixed picture. Yeah. And so the, the wording that I oftentimes use is that I think all pain has a physical component, a psychological component, and an emotional component to it. And so I agree with you that sometimes, like if there's a disc pushing against a nerve, people can feel that. But what I say and what I believe is that that physical component oftentimes is much less than we would have imagined. And if people are just coming into this knowledge about this concept, you would normally think that the physical component would be 100%. That's the intuitive idea. But I find that it's 10% or 5% or 1%. And so I say the same thing to people, start moving on the psychological, emotional side. And you may find that even if you think it's a 50, 50 or 70, 30, you may find that you're getting so much better working on those areas that either we find out there just isn't very much of a physical component, or it's so small as to be essentially a non-issue. Once that, that's the rest very, of it. very well stated and, and goes along with my experience as well. And just to share the experience of uh, David Hanscom, a retired uh, spine surgeon from the Seattle area who's written a couple of books in this field. And he, he took patients during the, toward the end of his career when he had really adopted a mind-body method uh, in many people. He took patients who he felt were absolutely candidates for surgery. But he said to them, I'd prefer you do this program for three or four weeks first. And it was a modification. It wasn't exactly what I do. It wasn't exactly what you do. But it was basically a mind-body type program with some other elements. Do this for three or four weeks and then come back and see me. And if everything's around, you know, the same, we'll, we'll go ahead and schedule an operation for you. And he found that a significant percentage of people that he as a qualified spine surgeon thought absolutely needed spine surgery. And he doesn't see the mild cases because he was a complex spine surgeon at, uh, uh, in Seattle during his practice, he found that 75% of the patients came back and said, thanks very much. I'm actually feeling better. I don't want to do surgery. And he went, fine, you don't need to do it. So that really, again, shows how even with a very limited program, even without a lot of mind-body education, less than you and I would provide, that people who were exposed to the idea that their health was more than just the sum of their bones, joints, and ligaments and discs um, often did not need, did not require surgery. I saw a patient recently who I'd actually seen five years ago. I had forgotten I'd seen him, but uh, he was at the hospital. He came to see me at the hospital when I was there. And he called me and said, you know, I, he had talked to him five years ago. He had done so well. And then all of this had come back and he was scheduled for surgery next week. And unlike you, I am not a great radiologist. And so I oftentimes will rely on the report. Occasionally I'll look at the film, but his disc was so bad that even I could see it on the film. And so we kind of talked through it and I was like, you know what, like, let's check and see what it looked like five years ago. And so we went back in his records and it was the exact same picture five years ago as it was now. And he'd had this intervening four years and 11 months of feeling totally fine. But then COVID happened. He had three small children. Work was stressful. Everybody was home in this small space. Yeah. And it sort of popped up again. And we talked through it. And the surgery got canceled. Now that's, a, that's a very good way to look at the fact that um, when you get a, an MRI of a part of your body, unfortunately, we don't have an MRI from a month before or two months before when you had no symptoms. It may have looked exactly the same. Nobody's getting MRIs preventively. They did do a study, though, at Stanford, a doctor by the name of Karaji, where he had the opportunity to do a number of MRIs on people with back pain symptoms over a period of a year, back pain and other related symptoms. And he found kind of what you found and published it, which is that very often the MRI did not change, although symptoms changed significantly. He didn't have a mind-body explanation for those symptoms like we do, but he did not have a structural explanation either because he said the MRI looks the same as it did previously. So I think, again, there's, there's scientific support for that, experience support for that. And um, again, health is more complicated than it sometimes is cracked out to be by a particular subspecialty. 
Um, when you when you see people initially, you talked about the type T personality. Can you tell people a little bit about kind of what you've observed over time and what you mean by that? A significant number of the people that I see with chronic symptoms, mind body symptoms, this this uh, disorder that we're discussing or these symptoms that we're discussing, have a number of characteristics in common. I think the mo the one I hear the most is I'm very hard on myself. So I ask people, are you hard on yourself? Occasionally, a person will say, I'm not that hard on myself, but the, but the spouse had come with them that day and they go, he's really hard on himself. And so it's sometimes you need an observer to clarify that for you. So that's one thing that I ask, are you hard on yourself? Another one is responsible. You know, if you had to find a group of very responsible people, probably good COVID mask wearers in, in, in social environments and things like that, you'd probably take a group of people with mind-body disorders and you'd find them there. Because they're very often responsible they get the work done, they're responsible for others, they're responsible um, often the least so for themselves. We could get back to that later, but so that's another characteristic is responsibility. Another one is um, many, not all, but many people with this uh, tendency are, are people pleasers. They're sensitive to how others see them, perceive them, and they want to be liked. And again, another characteristic, and you don't have to have all of these, but many people with these conditions have a number of them is something that Sarno called a goodist. And it's basically someone who wants to see the world be better. And, and it, it takes it very personally when things aren't as good as they would like them to be. Uh, so those are a number of the characteristics I, I look for. I, I have people fill out a questionnaire with this. I train my staff to ask these questions before I even see the patient. And then of course I, I reinforce it with my own question. And one, one can understand how these personality characteristics while highly desirable in a partner in a, uh, a loved one, uh, business partner, social partner, whatever, might, be, might create more tension, might create more uh, internal uh, tension and stress that can come out in many cases in physical symptoms if it doesn't come out in anxiety or other types of symptoms as well. Which is why I frequently say one of the things I love so much about this area of medicine is that the people who come to see me are so nice. It's, it's great. I love it. And it, sometimes that niceness, I think, gets in the way and will come out in physical ways. And we can talk about that and work on it. But in on average, like, it is just a delightful group of people to work and with. Very organized in many cases, not all, but very organized. Um, many people will come in with sheets of paper and lists of what symptoms and treatments and things like that as well. So I've also heard you talk about the difference you sometimes see as people getting better. I think you termed it as cognitive TMS and deep TMS. And so can you talk a little bit about what you've observed in terms of what people need to work on and how they get better and what those two areas are? I've always been intrigued by the fact that Dr. Sarno and then subsequently when I started to write books and things like that, that there were what, what, what we call a book cure. So in other words, somebody could have a medical problem and spend thousands of dollars on it, seen dozens of doctors, and then they read a book and they get better. How's that possible? So I, I call that kind of cognitive TMS, meaning that the educational input alone was sufficient to change the way of thinking that had led to the amplification of signals, perhaps in the nervous system and the Neural, neural, path, neural pathways and circuits to perpetuate the pain. So in this case, educational information alone, cognitive changes, thought, is enough to cure the problem. Um, I emphasize that approach quite a bit with people. I wrote a book called Think Away Your Pain because I thought that, I, I believe that think, thinking is a huge element in getting better from this. On the other hand, there are, I do believe in journaling, which is emotional expression. And I do refer quite a few of the patients I see in my office I don't want to estimate a percentage, but to highly qualified TMS therapists, therapists who specialize in the mind-body approach, um, either in the Los Angeles area or around the country. And now that everybody's doing things virtually, it doesn't really matter where you are other than the time zone. Um, and these, th this is for patients who take the home program, study it, come back in a few weeks, maybe, maybe getting a little bit better, but it's unearthed some issues that need to be dealt with. The journaling can be a very effective way to realize that, hey, I need to look at some things a little more deeply. Or I can sense that, again, myself from talking to people for, for years about their, their issues. 
So that's when they need to go deeper. They need to work with a therapist who can spend that 50 minute hour once a week, typically, and help them to explore their childhood and how that might be uh, having uh, after effects, after reverberations in their life. They can look at their relationships. They can look at their um, self-esteem issues, their you know, things that relate to this condition. So that would be deeper TMS, as I would call it. And so it, it, it sort of relates to how people get better, what techniques or approaches they need to get better, and um, perhaps the depth of the pathways or other things that we don't yet understand in terms of how the brain works in neuroplasticity. It's a really important point because a lot of people will come to me and say, you know, I think in, in the books that, that I haven't written, but that you and our colleagues have written, there's a lot of stories about cognitive TMS mm -hmm. in those books. And they're really nice stories and they're really compelling. And for people for whom they can deal with the symptoms that way, it's great. But a lot of people read the books, do the journaling, sort of, you know, see me, see you, and, and still aren't getting better. And then people start to, you know, people are, the people who are doing this are probably naturally predisposed to getting down on themselves anyways. And so now they're feeling badly because they haven't healed well enough. And so one of the things that I try to do as soon as I can with people is just normalize the process that yes, some people are able to hear us speak, read a book, see a video, and it makes sense and they get better. But there are lots and lots of people who, who need more yeah. after yeah, that, that's, that's crucially important. And of course, we're speaking to an audience, perhaps, of some people who are using an app now and, and may not have seen a physician. Um, but the people with this condition are often impatient patients. They want to get better fast. They, they're not really type A per se, but they're people who've done well in life often or, or you know, very responsible people tend to do a little bit better regardless of what they're doing. And so... Um, why aren't they getting better? Of course, they ask them, you know, I read in this book that so-and-so got better in three weeks. Why is it taking me a couple of months? So I do try to normalize that as well. I also, out of respect for Dr. Sarno, I, I blame it on New York editors. So I say that, you know, his books were edited by New York editors. They want to sell books. So they, they fixed it up so that the stories that were included were people who got dramatically better quickly. I tried to, in my book, which was not edited by a New York editor, it was edited by a Hawaii editor, um, and not from a major publishing company. I tried to include in my books stories of people who got better quickly, but also those who had recurrences or, or got better, it took longer to get better. And I think people realize that when they read the book, because you don't want to feel like you're the, you're the outlier. You're the one that's not succeeding at this. I tell people from the beginning, when they say to me, how long is this going to take to get better? I say, well, I don't know. And if I, even if I have a suspicion, I'd rather not tell you because that's going to put pressure on you. You're going to get better in the time that it needs for you to take to get better as long as you do the work that we're discussing. And I think that takes a little bit of the pressure off, but it tends to come up again in follow-up visits or follow-up emails or that type of thing, which is um, the need to be somewhat patient with this process. If you think about the nervous system, the central nervous system, the brain that's sitting in our head, as far as we know, it's the most complicated structure in the universe that we've yet identified. And so making dramatic changes in it to eliminate a process that is affecting your life in a significant way, whether it be pain or another psychophysiologic process, one can't always expect that's going to occur in three days or even three weeks or even three months in some cases, right? So you really have to think about the fact that you're, you're doing something amazing by using the Curable app, by seeing the doctors uh, here, by reading these books, by doing the, the journaling. You're doing something really remarkable, which is you're changing your brain. You're changing your nervous system and it, it takes a little while. I've got, you know, this Hope for Healing series. It's a combination of conversations with, with you and other of our colleagues and then patients of mine who have done well. And so I'm in conversation with one of my patients who uh, she's spoken on panels that I've had before, but I say she got about half a percent better every month for four years. And that's mm -hmm. how she got better. And so I would love and, and probably will sometime in the fall bring her on to tell the story of how just very, very slowly and steadily uh, she continued to get better because there are a lot of people out there who I know have been working on this for a year or two years or longer and still feel like 
trying to make the breakthroughs. And so I think it's important to hear from people who are on the other side of that, who had those same frustrations of, you know, it's been three weeks or three months and why am I not, not better yet? And there's a variety of reasons that that happens, but um, trying to give voice to, to those stories. Yeah, well, most people get better you know, faster than, than, than obviously that one individual, but the trend is important. You know, if I'm seeing somebody and there's progress being made, even though there may be some stops and starts along the way, obviously that's encouraging for them and for me. One of the things people struggle with is accepting, I call it accepting the diagnosis, even if you haven't seen a doctor, it's accepting this concept, accepting the, the essence of this. And if you're making progress, you begin to go, oh yeah, this is kind of working for me. And that gives you, it builds on itself. But it still requires patience and persistence. And you can't fix this by being doing 36 hours over a weekend of it in my experience you have to kind of do a little bit at a time one of the things about the workbook that i wrote is i tell people 10 or 15 minutes a day of journaling for a month keeps this in your mind you, you keep you doing something every day and maybe you're listening to a podcast maybe you're you're reading a chapter in a book or listening to an audible book you're doing a little bit every day in a couple of different areas and that's how you change the nervous system rather than maybe an explosive experience May, may help a small number of people, but most people need to work on this over a period of time. So your second book, Think Away Your Pain, came out, I think, four or five years ago. And that was, you know, probably 15 years after the Mind Body Workbook came out. What are some of the important takeaways that people can get if they pick up your book and, and read it? What I was trying to do in this book is build upon Dr. Sarno's work and really explain the mind-body concepts very clearly, but incorporating some of the more modern neuroscience that's developed over the last 20 years. Some of the very powerful studies in functional MRI imaging of the brain and other research that really, in a way, corroborates what Dr. Sarno found, but uses very different language than he used. He was a very Freudian-oriented author the unconscious was the most important thing to him that he spoke about a lot with patients and in his books. And again, I'm a little bit more, I value those concepts, but I'm a little bit more cognitively oriented in terms of uh, thinking and reprocessing thought and, repros and processing emotion in, in different ways. And so that was what I was trying to accomplish with that book was to update the work and offer something of, of, of from my own experience. Um, it took me quite a while to write it, although in the last six months, it kind of moved along quickly, but I tried it, stopped and started over the years trying to write the book. And what I think I struggled with is I really had to build a distance from Dr. Sarno in a sense in order to write it because I, I, I couldn't be, I needed to be respectful. I, I mean, I said in the book, he should receive a Nobel prize. At that point he was still alive, so he could have gotten one. Unfortunately, it, that particular um, honor is not, a, a, awarded to people who've been, who've been deceased, which he, he died a couple of years ago. But uh, I offer him tremendous honor and respect in the book. And at the same time, science and medicine and knowledge is, is, is building on the shoulders of giants and building on top of that. So uh, each of us in the field is trying to you know, make contributions and, and add to that and offer our own perspectives and learn from each other. And, um, and that, that, was, that was the purpose of my writing the book. Yeah, it's really fun to be on the, the front lines of this. It's such a it's such a powerful way of healing people, and obviously, there's not that much going on around the country or around the world in this area of medicine. So it's been really fun for me to be able to really be on the front lines of how to diagnose this, how to treat it, how to approach this aspect of medicine. I might differ with you slightly in that I think things are going on around, around the world. It's not necessarily in our core community that is, is growing as fast as we would like it, but the, you begin to see the language of physicians, psychologists, pain physicians in Europe and North America is starting to incorporate more of the concepts that really are what Dr. Sarno spoke about 40 years ago, 45 years ago, and that we've been speaking about for years ourselves, but not yet, the, the language and the terminology hasn't yet merged 
in, the, in perhaps the most effective way for patients. But I, you know, we, we both see improvement in this over the years, um, just not perhaps explosive growth. And it's interesting too, because there is, you know, if you walk into a room of physicians these days and you say, how many of you think that stress contributes to pain, right? Most people will raise their hands at this point. And when, when I trained or when you trained, maybe we wouldn't have gotten that response. And so it's not that people don't recognize, I think, the mind-body connection these days, but there is a language component. And so physicians don't always know how to talk with patients about it. And sometimes it comes out sounding either quite awkward or blaming sometimes, or it's in your head because, you know, that's a very powerful insult to people in a typical medical office, not because it's completely inaccurate, because it's generally used as, I'm sorry, this is not my purview, there's nothing I can do, please leave and go see a psychiatrist or whatever it is. And so one of my goals over time is to help physicians and other practitioners learn the language to say, Yes, there's a contribution of what's going on in our lives that shows up in our bodies, which is good news because we know how to treat that. And there's been a ton of research over the past 20 years that has both shown that to be the case and shown us what's effective in getting the pain and the symptoms to calm down. The other thing that I see is that lots of people in the pain psychology field or chronic pain know that this connection exists but they still somehow treat the pain as if it's separate, right? If you meditate enough, if you learn cognitive therapy, you can learn to manage the pain better. And so also teaching practitioners the language of the stress is the pain, the thoughts are the pain, and we're not trying to heal or manage something that's mysterious. This is what human beings do. We take our experiences, we put them into our bodies. And as we recognize that more and recognize kind of what's going on and how we deal with that, then we get all these opportunities to, to get the symptoms to get better. Well, that's very well stated. Um, I was involved with a, a national uh, com a, com it was a committee to, to work on some new pain guidelines and things. And, I, I chose the psychology division, although I'm not a psychologist, but who else is in the psychology division? Of course, a PhD pain psychologist from a number of different um, academic centers. And they worded it in such a way, as I knew they probably would, that we're, our goal is with psychology is to help relieve some percentage of the pain or something of that sort. So I said to them, I've published data where the pain goes down to zero in many cases. They said, we've never heard of that. We've never seen that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I mean, I can share you the study. I'll show you the study, but I mean, what, don't you even consider the possibility that pain can go to zero? Isn't that your goal? And if it's not your goal, how would you ever get anybody to zero if your goal is to only get them to 30% better? So we struggle with this. And eventually, unfortunately, I was outvoted. And that shows part of the problem you're talking about here. And with regard to physicians, they tend to have a hard time, uh, unfortunately, breaking out of the shell of, of the way they were trained. We've had great experiences you and I do throughout our training and subsequently in, you, in your case before your medical school uh, even that that made us more open to this approach and then once you've seen it work either in yourself or in other in your patients it suddenly makes you more of an advocate and more of a person who can apply it so many people who give it lip service so to speak yes yeah, stress causes this but they don't really know how to apply it we haven't yet had the opportunity unfortunately to teach them and then my final comment on that is that many physicians, unfortunately, are not that uh, gifted or interested in really having a conversation with a the patient. They want to have a brief interaction and then touch and then prescribe. And this involves a little bit of a longer conversation, a little bit longer uh, delving into things. So many physicians just don't want to do that. Maybe they're not selecting people to medical school who want to do that or the small number are going into psychiatry and not into the med uh, other medical fields. But um, and then I'll add one final point, which is I think we need to get this into the society at the uh, school level. So this past year, I started to work on a school curriculum for middle school, high school. I know you have kids in, in that age group. And I, we, we piloted it in one school. And of course, the pandemic came along. So we kind of had to sort of stop things. But I wrote a mind-body workbook for teens this year. And its primary purpose is to 
be used in this curriculum, but it, it is available also for purchase. But the idea again is if we could expose younger people to these concepts, then if they did in their 20s or 30s have a mind body or a stress related symptom, they would go, oh, yeah, I learned that about, about that in school. You know, I'm not as afraid of it, or maybe I can find a doctor I can talk to about it, or a psychologist or something. So a few, few random thoughts in re response to your very clear statements. I've got, I've got a list of people who I want to bring into this video podcast series, many of whom are in, in this field, but some who are not. One of whom is Mark Brackett, who is the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, just wrote a really nice book called Permission to Feel. And so I was out at, at Yale a couple of years ago for a reunion and heard him speak and talk to him a little bit. But they've done a ton of work in the school systems out in the Northeast about putting emotional education into the classroom. And one of the things he talks extensively about is that they learned over time that they needed buy-in from every level of the school system in order to really make it work well. And so they couldn't just work with the kids, they had to work with the teachers, and they couldn't just work with the teachers, they had to work with the administrators, and they couldn't just work with the local administrators, they had to work with uh, uh, the system-wide administrators. And when they do that in school systems, it really does transform the experience of the kids there. Wonderful, I had not heard of that, and I'm gonna to definitely to look into that, what they're doing a little bit more. At this point in time, emotional intelligence and emotional awareness and emotional learning education is so important. We have a, a vaping epidemic. We have an increased rate of suicide among teens. We have a variety of problems uh, in that age group. And now we have the pandemic screwing up schools for a year, perhaps. So there's, every, there's a tremendous amount of um, work that needs to be done in this area. I was trying I can't kind of put in a limited uh, one week sort of component of the curriculum. And I was focusing on private schools that don't have as many layers of buy-in to at least uh, pilot the approach. But uh, I, th I think Dr. Brackett, it sounds like is doing some great work. I'd like to reach out to him at some point. Absolutely. So speaking of COVID-19, this video cast series initially started as a response to that and what we could do to try to bring some hope to people during this time. It's, I'm here in Chicago, you're in Los Angeles, we're in a little bit of a lull. You guys, I think, are being hit pretty hard at the moment. How have you, um, A, seen it affect your patients over these months? And B, is there anything that you've found that you've been able to do for your or your family that has been helpful in managing through this time? Well, my patients uh, generally have been extremely responsible. Maybe that's partially the, the mind-body component here of, of the practice, but uh, people seem to be following instructions. I happen to have a lot of people who are able to work at home, which is certainly an advantage, the, uh, the tech workers and that type of thing, technology. Um, but in, in terms of affecting people, I mean, everyone is getting, gets cooped up after a month uh, stay-at-home order, two months, so just, uh, and, and I think we're seeing the opposite of responsible behavior in, in, in California, you're probably seeing it in other states, Florida, wherever, which is you've been cooped up for a while, you're told things are getting better, and then you're supposed to be stage one release, and then suddenly you're at stage three in four days, and it's too fast. You know, we just need to do it more slowly. And uh, in terms of my own family, um, you know, I'm encouraging, I'm doing it myself, so you always want to start with yourself. I'm trying to get exercise every day outside. I think that's very important, especially during the the full lockdown period, and uh, whether it's a brisk walk or jog or golf or something, trying to do something outside every day is important. Um, I've tried to incorporate more meditation in my life, and uh, I try to do that on a daily basis. And um, you know, my my sons have been very responsive. So one of my sons actually has immunity, we believe, antibodies. Uh, you know, there's some controversy, but I happen to think he at this point is is not going to get coronavirus again. But we're all trying to be careful. And um, my other son is, is, is pretty responsible doing distancing, uh, social experiences with friends like hikes at a distance. And um, they're doing a lot of online stuff, video games, unfortunately, but also, uh, you know, Zoom and that type of thing. And um, it, it's affected everybody tremendously, as all of you know. I'm not telling you anything that you, anyone listening here doesn't know. Uh, I do go to the office and I, I see a few patients and most of it is telemedicine now which has expanded my opportunity to see people 
including um, more out of state, but um, I also come home and change my clothes every day. And I've been tending to go for more of a, a casual kind of scrub and, and polo shirt type approach so I can throw my clothes immediately in the laundry rather than uh, wearing them. I don't know if that's absolutely necessary, but it makes me feel more comfortable and um, you know, using a variety of precautions at work. Obviously, I'm wearing a mask. I, I use a face shield if I get very close to patients as well. And in some situations, I have to use other types of gowns if I'm getting closer to someone that I'm concerned about in terms of the disease. But I alternate rooms more often. If I see somebody in a room, I don't use that room for a while. I mean, some of these aspects are probably not that interesting, but it just points out how, how different all of our lives are, whether you work in uh, retail or whether you work in hotels or whether you're a doctor, whatever you do, your, your life has been thrown upside down. So that points to the need to try to do self-care strategies. You know, self-care is part of the approach we take to mind-body disorders, but exercise is an important self-care strategy. Um, journaling can be an important self-care strategy, even if you're not having a symptom. Meditation and prayer can be important strategies, uh, depending on your own uh, particular philosophies and approaches in that area. And uh, doing, I don't like people overeating because it's not very healthy for them, especially a disease that seems to hit people who are heavier or harder. But finding things that you can get some pleasure out of every day and uh, trying to emphasize that I think can be helpful as well. What kind of strategies are you using, John? So um, very similar ones. We've taken a lot of family walks over these three or four months. I hooked up with a yoga studio in North Carolina. I think the link actually was Michael Galinsky who directed the movie All the Rage. Um, so he practiced with that studio and he had told me about it. So they had done a lot of online work early in the pandemic. And so I got a subscription to their site, Thousand Petals Yoga in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I've been doing about an hour of yoga, maybe five mornings a week through most of this, which has been, which has been great for me. I also, interestingly, and I know you have non-mind-body patients as well in your practice, my mind-body medicine patients are so good at knowing about this that their response to pandemic kind of dwarfs what some of my other patients are doing. They, are, they understand that emotions are okay. They understand that all kinds of emotions are okay. They understand the need for self-care. And so a lot of, you know, it's not that they're not having trouble, but my patients who are really having trouble because they're living by themselves or just really struggling with this whole concept, they tend to be some of my more conventional medicine patients who don't have the same skills that so many people who are here have fostered over time. So that's actually been interesting to see that sort of knowing about this area of medicine has been somewhat insulating for, for my patients. That's very interesting. I mean, I've also noticed, and patients have pointed this out, that if you tend to be an introvert, you don't mind being home a lot more. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of an interesting benefit in that particular personality type. On the other hand, if you tend to be anxious, it's a lot more anxiety provoking. That's why you have to stay away from the media. You know, I was sending out regular weekly or t uh, every two week uh, updates on COVID, very simple, clear, scientifically based and um, calm. And people seem to appreciate that because they realize that the media is just uh, sometimes making things o over the top in terms of the way they look at things, sometimes scientifically inaccurate, even though they say they're scientifically focused. But, um, you know, we're all, it's, a, it's a difficult time. We're all trying to do our best. It sounds like you've done a good job educating your mind body patients so that they are using those skills uh, in other aspects of life, which is great. They really are. I've been really impressed with what they've done. There are, there are a number of questions that have been coming in as we're talking. And so I have a couple more questions for you. And then you have some time to stick around and oh, absolutely, yeah. questions. So, so those of you who are listening live, uh, either on Zoom or on Facebook, you can go ahead and continue to send questions either into the Facebook chat or the Zoom chat. We'll get to those in just a sec. Um, Dave, one of the questions I get asked regularly, and I'm wondering about your experience with this over time, is what are the best ways to talk about mind-body medicine with other people in your circle? Not necessarily you or I, but, but people who are learning about this themselves, whether it's to intimate partners or friends or people at work. Have you found any strategies for people that seem to work well as they try to explain what they're doing to other people? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because on my list of this 12 stages of healing, my 12 stages sharing, sharing this message with others, 
But at the same time, I realize and have realized over the years that some people become almost too evangelical about it and it gets them kind of thrown off because some people don't, don't respond very nicely or respond very uh, openly to hearing about these ideas. So I, I think that people appreciate brief personal stories. I mean, most we're talking about now people who are not physicians, They're, they've had a personal experience, uh, lay, lay people. So if you just share an experience that, you know, I wasn't getting better with a number of approaches, and then I found Dr. Strax or the Curable app or the Mind Body Workbook. And, and I, I noticed that it helped me because uh, I realized that stress was playing a role in my, my illness or my health or my problem. And then just leave it at that, see if somebody's interested. A lot of this work that I have found over the years is planting a seed and waiting for it to grow. An example of this is I cannot tell you how many of the patients I've seen over the years have told me that a relative or a friend or a coworker gave them a book. It might've been Sarno's book, more recently it might've been my book. And they got the book and they looked at it and they said, no, it doesn't really apply. Put it on their bookshelf or like behind me here or on a, on a table, ignored the book for six months. And then for some reason we're having symptoms or something, picked up the book and became engrossed in it. Read it over the weekend and then immediately called my office. How, how quickly can I get an appointment with Dr. Schechter, right? So what happened during those prior six months? Well, this relates to that psychological concept of stages of change. You know, there's a readiness for change that sometimes people have to get to. So that's an example where you might approach somebody and just plant the seed with the idea, but they might come back to you a month later and say, tell me a little bit more about what you did with that stress thing. I might be ready to look into that now and check out that app or read that book or talk to that doctor. And so I, I think that that's one aspect of it is that it's, you know, brief personal stories. I also say if, it, if it's a spouse, usually a spouse won't read a book for you. Uh, they probably won't even listen to a podcast for you, but they might sit on the couch and watch a movie. So, you know, All the Rage uh, and other movies that are coming out on this subject can be something that you can stream. Uh, and so that can be helpful for people to get a little bit of exposure, put your feet, feet up on the couch. And now, of course, YouTube and podcasts you can listen to on your TV if you have a smart TV. So you can put your feet up on the couch and and uh, check Facebook and, and listen to this on the, TV, uh, on the couch if you want. But you don't want to be too pushy. And at the same time, it's hard not to share this with someone who you think this might help because you're a caring person, you want to help your friend, relative, whatever. And I would just caution people, the hardest people to help, unfortunately, are the ones closest to you. It's easier to help people farther away in the circle. Uh, that's been my experience, uh, familial and otherwise, uh, over the decades. I just had a, a nice experience, actually. I was talking with one of my cousins. It was like a COVID, let's get together on Zoom, which we don't normally do yeah. kind of thing. And I was telling him a little bit about it. He's like, oh, that's really interesting. And so he actually sat in on one of the classes that I teach and did great. Like, he was back pain for 20 years and Fantastic. feeling great. I know, it was amazing. Um, and and he, he unusual. Kind of responded. You know, he responded. You spoke to him briefly, yeah. and then he came back and responded to you. So he was yeah. kind of interested. Yeah. Um, any, any stories that you've seen, I mean, obviously you've seen hundreds and thousands of patients who have gotten better. Any particular story stand out to you that, that you highlight or use when you give talks or write about this? I don't know. They've kind of, again, I, I included a yeah. half dozen or a dozen great ones in my book, but there've been so many that they do tend to blur together uh, over time. But it, it, there was an example of a person who you know, 15 years was unable to work, was unable to sleep on a normal mattress, was unable to go to a hotel because they're afraid they would have to sleep on a different kind of uh, bed than they, they normally slept at at home. And when they went through this program, just like the, 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 they just blossomed, they, their life returned. They were able to travel again, which now we can't really do very much anyway, but I mean, at the time we take, took it for granted that we could do that. They were able to travel, they were able to return to work after a long, it was just very gratifying to see somebody's, not only symptoms improve, but their life change in, in such a dramatic way after so many years of symptoms. So whether you have six months or a year of symptoms or whether you have 15 or 25 years of symptoms, I've seen dramatic improvement with work, with time uh, in, in, in using this methodology. So that's, that's very exciting and gratifying. We're gonna move into the question and answer in just a sec. Anything else that you wanna highlight for people before we do that? Anything else that you found is particularly important that you've learned 
over time. We've, already, we've talked about a lot already, but. Well, I th the two things I emphasize with, in my office with patients and um, in other settings is uh, accepting the diagnosis. So you have to actually believe in this. You know, you can't kind of do it half-heartedly. And so you have to figure out what it's gonna take for you to believe this. It might mean reviewing uh, your lab results with Dr. Strax or your imaging with me in order to do that. Um, and then the other thing would be the shift from folk from thinking structurally, thinking, I wouldn't use the term physically because everything's physical, but thinking structurally about your problem or chemically, if in fact it's not a structural or chemical problem, to, to thinking psychologically. I think those are the two key elements to getting better that I've emphasized over the years and found helpful. So I'll just mention those. I'm sure you'll have other good questions coming up in a moment. Yeah, let's see. I know there are a number of them that have come in. And so let me just pull a couple up. Uh, I've recently realized the majority of my symptoms come from stress at work, family office. Uh, I don't know how to feel safe or calm down at work. And I feel trapped in this cycle because I can't quit my job. Um, I, I do feel like I've sort of made a list of all the reasons that people get symptoms. And so workplace issues are, are it's their own category in my mind. Is there anything that you found that's helpful when the workplace situation is where the stress is coming from? Well, I see, I see that a lot, the workplace, as you do. The, fir the first thing um, I, I would say is that the symptom is, is obviously a signal. And it's a signal of something not being quite right. And so in this case, this individual identified it as stress from work. By the way, sometimes it's other things as well beyond what first comes to you. Um, at this particular point, you have a number of options. At this, this individual is excluding the possibility of leaving that family law office, uh, which might ultimately be the best for some individuals. I'm not saying for that particular person, I don't know them, so I'm not gonna give them any direct advice. But maybe there are ways to have conversations or meetings with other people in the office in some way to improve the environment. Even five or 10% might reduce your stress level 50%. And then you also have to think about what you're doing outside of the job to balance it. So you might need to go to the gym every day if the gym was open or go for a run every day or swim or blast some golf balls at the driving range. You might need to do something to really directly release that. You also might need to journal every day. You might need to close your door in that office and meditate twice a day for five minutes or pray or read a book of wisdom or something that is significant to you so that you can balance off what's going on. But it's very difficult. Work is a big part of our day. I mean, it's more than half of most people's uh, waking hours and so it, it's a big factor and it's, it's challenging. I talk frequently with people about the concept of boundaries, how we know what belongs to us and what belongs to other people and how to tell the difference between the two. And there are frequent bound, boundary violations in the workplace, especially if it's a family business, I think. And so I do advise people to try to get some clarity if possible about whether it whether better boundaries can get put in place i was talking with a patient about that this morning actually i i say frequently like i've never worked in the corporate world worked in a corporate hospital but not in in corporate america and so the rules i'm sure are different but what i found when i was working in a big organization is that i had more ability to set boundaries than i would have thought one example that I give frequently is that we gave talks in Las Vegas at a, a integrative medicine conference for a few years after I first got there, which was fun, but I'm not a huge Vegas fan and there wasn't, we didn't get paid and it was sort of a pain in the, in the neck. And so I got back one year, it was in December, so around Christmas time, and I told my supervisor that I wasn't gonna do it the next year. She said, you know, here's your topic for next year. I'm like, I'm not doing it next year. She's like, oh yes, you are. I was like, no, no, actually I drew the boundary. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it next year. And she pushed back on the boundary once. She said, no, no, really, you're, you're gonna do it, right? I was like, no. And then she literally like just walked to the person sitting next to me and said, hey, you wanna give this talk in Vegas next year? <laughs> literally the person sitting next to me. That's funny. That's really, that's a good story. Um, and so, all right, next question is about fear. Can constant fear trigger TMS symptoms to get started? A lot of people say it's repressed emotions. 
but can it start in the middle of, of fear and stress? How do, you, how do you think about the role of fear in all well, of this? Fear, fear is one of the uh, emotions that can trigger this. You know, anger is emphasized a lot in Dr. Sarno's work, but anxiety, fear are other key emotions, I believe, grief. And you know, an example of this would be, has anyone ever been nervous before, I don't know, a golf shot in front of a, a pro or, in, or taking a test in school? maybe you get, your heart starts racing. Okay, so that's a psychophysiologic response. Has anyone ever been embarrassed? Okay, you, you blush, right? That's a psychophysiologic response. There's, you're, not, you're, you're not touching your skin with hot and cold to change the color. It's purely an emotional reaction. So fear can, can definitely cause symptoms. Repressed emotion is a concept of, of how to look at a longer standing problem, in my opinion. If you're dealing with an acute symptom, you might want to just look at what's going on right at that moment, because it's more likely probably to be related to something that's going on that day or even that hour than it is something from your childhood. But if you're talking about a more chronic symptom that doesn't respond to the initial cognitive kind of approaches I alluded to before, then you, you're looking deeper at emotion that may not be at the surface, but is very significant. So yes, I think it, it definitely can. And I agree, and I would, you know, to highlight what you said when this work first came out, when you were first starting and I was first learning about it, it there really was this big focus on anger and rage, which sometimes is the case. I've certainly seen that. Um, one of my patients who had uh, really bad, was burning mouth syndrome, actually. I just couldn't get rid of it and would contact me every six months for years. And to have anything different. And one day we, we just sat down, actually it was, must've been during COVID because I think we did it on, on Zoom. And I, I invited her to get like irately angry with her sister who had like really, really done some not nice things. And she did for 45 minutes and it, it made a huge difference. And so sometimes it is the rage, but as you're saying, oftentimes it's not. It's sadness or grief or guilt or shame or, or fear or, or just the attention to the symptom that doesn't mm -hmm. calm down. And so I think lots of reasons other than anger that, that symptoms will pop up. Uh, what ways of communicating the psychological component of pain have been most successful in getting people open to this idea? So the person who wrote this question says they work with veterans and a small percentage are open to the concept, even though it would help so many of them overcome their pain. And so I was actually, I think I didn't ask you this question, but I was thinking about it because both you and I will see people who don't know about this medicine in our office. And so how do you bring it up to people who have never heard of this concept when they come to see you? That's, a, that's a, another good question. I mean, sometimes the word stress is less, um, it's less difficult for people to hear than psychophysiologic or mind body or that type of thing. Because everybody sort of knows about stress. And Dr. David Clark, who wrote some books in that area, you know, talks about stress illness. And that's a kind of a good concept to that. For a veteran, I don't know if they are, or if, it, if the term combat fatigue or shell shock or things, which have been around for 100 years, um, I don't know if those terms are easier to accept or harder to accept and, and then more modern terms like uh, stress or uh, minimal traumatic brain injury or these sorts of things. But however you can begin to present it and not make it threatening to them, obviously, initially, but more of this is a way that can help you. I, I talk with people about the fact that uh, elite athletes use a lot of sports psychology. And so if very high paid elite athletes will use sports psychology to be better at hitting that putt at the Masters or that shot at the NBA championship, then why shouldn't you consider using psychology uh, techniques to be better at dealing with the, uh, your, your da daily life? And so you can make it kind of a performance psychology or a, a sports psychology or a, a veteran psychology thing that is more performance-based. I just want you to be able to achieve the most you can in your post-military life. And in order to do that, I'm gonna teach you some skills that can help you to get there based on our work with other veterans who've been in the same situation you have. So you're just trying to find ways, I think, to present it in a less threatening way. Do you have any other thoughts, John? 
I tend to bring it up really tentatively with people who don't know about it. And so even to the point where sometimes I'll say, you know, in certain situations, there are people who think that maybe there's the possibility mm -hmm. that occasionally sometimes life can get into our bodies and um, stress can show up in physical ways. Does that make sense? And, and I'll kind of wait for their response. And, you know, I've had people like look at me and say like, that's crazy. And, and so then I don't usually go very much further if that's the response. But like you said, a lot of times we're, we're planting seeds. And, and then sometimes people are really interested. And so uh, a patient of mine, Jessica Dixon, who was the first guest on the Hope for Healing series and talked about how she healed her migraines, that was the conversation we had. And I actually, I listed out a number of different options. It's like, well... You know, some people think chiropractic is helpful. We have a really good acupuncturist here. Maybe we'll change your diet a little bit. And sometimes people think that stress can cause migraines. And she remembers thinking like, oh, what's that one? I want to hear more about that one. And so clearly, if you don't bring it up, people aren't going to latch onto it. And so, you know, when I was, when I was a medical student, I made a vow that anytime I ever saw somebody with back pain, I was going to ask them what was going on in their lives. And so the more, the more we bring this up, the more we at least mention it, the more opportunities people have to, to hear about it and get curious and ask and that questions. List, that listing approach is very good where you, where you had a number of different uh, things and then stress was one of them. Another thing in my office is, you know, I have my books kind of in different places or other people's books. And so it kind of makes people aware that I might ask those type of questions. And so I think maybe I self, self selects a little bit, even in the general practice for people who are a little bit interested in the mind body. It's on my website, my general website as well. So I think that that's advantages we have over other physicians that they already know that we might bring this up, so to speak. How do you think about your sports medicine physician? So a lot of people come to you with musculoskeletal injuries. How do you think about this question is about say a muscle strain. So hunching over a computer for a long time or pulled muscle that somebody might come in with. Do you do anything to try to differentiate what's going on and maybe potentially treat it more physically than non-physically or does it, does it still hold together for you? One of the things that I look for, of course, is acute versus chronic. I mean, if somebody was took up tennis recently and they've been hitting a lot of balls and their elbow hurts, I'm not necessarily looking for stress right there. I'm looking for more of an overuse type of condition or if their work environment has changed and they're suddenly shipping and, and, and receiving at Amazon, you know, it's more likely of a musculoskeletal issue, although there could also be stress factors as well. So acute versus chronic often helps me in that in the acute setting, ultimately the goal is to have a patient feel better. So some, I noticed in one of the questions, someone said, well, what if I do myofascial release or I get a massage? I have no problem with you getting a massage. Now you can't do that right now with the, with the pandemic. But uh, if you get better with a massage, fine. We don't have to pull out a workbook and pull out a bunch of stuff for you. That's great. So I'm open to the idea of physical treatments, especially in the acute, perhaps subacute setting. And that would include physical therapy and exercise and stretching and uh, so, somatic uh, tracking and, and chiropractic even. Uh, in the acute. But when you're talking about something that's not getting better, and you've tried four or five of these things, hey, we need to go a little bit different direction if we're gonna get the results you want. So one of the things over the years I've noticed is that unfortunately, desperation is a great uh, means to, to change. And we, we find it not just in mind-body medicine, but we also find it in other areas of medicine. But when someone is really bottomed out or they just tried everything, they're more open to, uh, more, more open to this approach. And so, I don't know, that's, that's my approach to it perhaps a little bit. I would also say that, and I say to patients regularly, it's pretty rare for somebody to come in with an acute strain and for me to ask them about stress and for them to say, no, nothing really is, is going on. And so I really do feel like some of those injuries, whether, whether it's a true injury or whether it has this component, it does seem to me in my experience that it's been more likely that there are intense stressors going on that are contributing. The other thing is whether maybe somebody has a prior history of mind-body disorders or, you know, I've worked, seen you in your office, et cetera, because then they're asking me, well, is this a flare-up of that prior condition or a return of that prior condition, or might this be something more short-term and benign? And, you know, there's lots of different ways to, to get to the end point of healing. So uh, I'm, I'm open to trying different things in the short term and uh, 
data shows that with regard to back pain, the, the key thing in the acute phase is just to tell people to uh, be as active as you physically can. A lot of data on this. It doesn't really matter if you do chiropractic, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories in the acute setting, just as long as you are as active as you're able to be. And that would reinforce also the psychological because if you're as active as you're able to be, you're not fearing it as much because you've been told by a doctor to be as active as you're able to be. So we don't always have, you know, you can ask the questions briefly, but we don't, I, I don't personally just delve as deeply into the emotional in those um, shorter term symptomatic things, unless I get a sense that it's really something I should, I should go after. I still throw my back out every now and then. Usually there's a lot of stress going on when I do, but invariably I get it better by physical activity, golf, mm -hmm. swimming, um, playing with my kids. And so I do think it's so important to get back to doing those. So I think we've got time for two more questions. One is about psychotherapists. And so how do you decide when to recommend that? And then how do you steer people towards a psychologist who, who understands what we're talking about? I think my decision is based in part on my initial psychosocial history, how deep it appears this, this condition is, 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 is um, related to emotional issues. So for example, someone with a very traumatic childhood, someone who had molestation, rape, et cetera, I would really probably more, more quickly lean toward, let's make this an integrative approach where I'm, I'm working with you, you have a home educational program and you're also working with a psychotherapist. And someone else who perhaps the issues don't seem to be as profound, maybe just a little personality uh, tweaking that's needed or a little bit more self-care strategies, then I might say, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it again in three or four weeks when we speak again, or when I, when I see you again, when I do a telehealth visit with you again, uh, wait till then. In terms of who I use, I, I have, I've been fortunate in Los Angeles over the years to um, have had developed relationships and in a sense helped to develop a, a coterie of therapists. Now, one of those therapists has built his own center, a number of other therapists. There's lots of good people in LA. I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard. So I have plenty of people to refer to. I have people in Northern California, people in other states. And I really like the idea that I'm picking the therapist for you because I, I find that I know the therapist well enough and I know the patient a little bit so I can try to make a match because I find that the personality can be important with regard to therapy. So I do a little bit of a matchmaking thing. I might give them more than one name, but there's usually like, try this one first, then that one, then this one. And usually it works out pretty well for everybody that way. Um, so I try to guide them toward the right person. It used to be that the geography was very important now because of the um, virtual nature of pretty much all psychotherapy right now. It doesn't really matter the geography at this point. Yeah, and we're, you and I are part of a, an email network of probably a couple of hundred therapists around the country who are, who are interested in this work, which is great. So last question, um, have, you found that, have you found patients who have bladder symptoms in the past that are related to mind-body medicine, chronic urgency, or burning? And have you, have you seen people have success with that type of symptom using this type of treatment? Bladder symptoms I've seen more in, in women than men, although men also have bladder issues, but this term interstitial cystitis is made by um, urologists. And sometimes I feel it's made um, too broadly without enough documentation. And they try different medications and things. And of course, if people get well, that's fine. People who come to me typically haven't gotten well from other things they've tried. And I've had a pretty good success using mind-body approaches for bladder-related symptoms, which can include urgency, pain, um, frequency. Uh, you know, of course, we make sure that everybody is worked up initially if they need to be, if they need to get a culture or urine analysis, or if they need to see a urologist, we might try that. But in someone especially younger, you don't worry as much in terms of the more serious causes. So you might start with the mind-body and then they didn't get better see the urologist, somebody older, you might do it in the reverse direction. Um, I'm sure you also make sure that your patients are appropriately worked up because we're not saying that every condition on earth is fixable by this uh, mind-body approach. And we, we do need to make sure that there's a, a very good likelihood that that's what's going on when we treat it. 
One of my patients very early on when I moved back to Chicago came to see me for, for mind body medicine for back pain. And she told me a story that she had had chronic bladder infections earlier in her life. And she went to physician to physician to physician and nobody could, could help her. And she said, finally, a urologist said to her some version of, you know, I, I don't even know exactly how to say this or why it is, but I think when you get mad, you get a bladder infection. And she said, she said, oh, that makes sense. And she says, you never had another bladder infection. That's and great. so somebody just needed to, to make that connection for her. And she was insightful and savvy enough to, to take it from there and figure out how to use it. I've seen that a lot with men in prostate infections. So prostate infections can, can definitely happen and very often get better with antibiotics. But men who get recurrent prostate infections and they can't find anything, they're all they call them uh, culture negative or whatever. I think that's usually a mind-body disorder and typically can be treated with this approach. It's, I think it's a combination of neural pathways and, and kind of a myofascial component of the perineum, which is stress and, stress and the tension is holding that area tight. And if you work on the mind-body, it, it seems to release these so-called prostate infections. Agreed. Anything else before we sign off for the evening? Anything else that has occurred to you as we've talked about these variety of, of mind-body topics? What's occurred to me is how much I've enjoyed talking to you tonight and how articulate you are on the subject. I'm so pleased that the Midwest has someone as excellent as you to, to work in this uh, regard around the Windy City. Um, but um, I, I feel like I've shared everything that I can. And I'm happy to answer more questions at another time, perhaps. But, that sounds uh, good. That sounds good. Having, it's, thank you for it's, having me. You're so welcome. And it's so nice to see you. Obviously, I don't get out to California that much. And so I haven't seen you in person for a while. But it's been great to spend this time with you. If people want to get in touch with you, how should they do that? I have two websites, SchechterMD.com, which is S-C-H-E-C-H-T-E-R-M-D.com, and MindBodyMedicine.com. The latter focuses on this mind-body approach but either website can get you to me. And then if you are interested in the books I mentioned, they're on Amazon and Kindle and Nook and Audible and all these sorts of things. So you can, you can look them up in that regard. And, and as I said earlier as well, uh, www.drstrax.com is the way to find with me. You can get information about my practice, find some resources about mind body medicine, sign up for our newsletter when you get there as well. So Dave, thanks so much for being here this evening. This was a delight for me. So I enjoyed it, John. Uh, it, was, it was a great conversation. So uh, thank you to everybody else who's been watching and listening either now or this will be up on Curable's Facebook page uh, probably sometime tomorrow or maybe even later this evening to watch a recording of. You can also link there from my website as well. So uh, feel free to rewatch or recommend to friends. I will be back here in three weeks. I've got a psychotherapy colleague, Dr. Dan Ratner, who practices in Cleveland. He's gonna be here with me talking about his experience in this field and then how he approaches this from a psychotherapeutic standpoint. So we will sign off there for this evening. Thanks everybody for sharing this time with us. Um, happy, either of us happy to answer questions for people who wanna consult with us further. Um, everybody's in good hands, obviously, with the Curable app as well. And so we hope everybody has a good evening and a good rest of your summer and continues to stay safe out there.